This is the fourth video in a series devoted to abstract algebra. And in the previous video, we looked at the definition of a group as well as some examples of groups. And we looked at finite groups and infinite groups. And we looked at a couple of examples of families of finite groups. And I'd like to recall those real quick before we look at our main goal for today, which is symmetry groups of polygons. So the three main families, or really it's two families and then a single group of finite groups were Zn. So that's made up of the equivalence classes where we're thinking about the equivalence relation congruence mod n. So it's the equivalence class of 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. And here the operation is addition. So the equivalence class of A plus the equivalence class of B is equal to the equivalence class of A plus B. And there's a bit of work to do to show that that is a well-defined operation, but it isn't too bad. I think it was an exercise from a previous video. Before we look at the next family, I'd like to point out that usually when we're working in Zn and not thinking about any other group, instead of writing these as equivalence classes with the brackets, we just write them as numbers. So you would write 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1, and then when you perform your addition, you just reduce mod n you know, after performing that addition. And we did a bunch of examples of that in the previous video. Then the next group we looked at was the group of units modulo n, and we denoted this by un. And that's going to be all equivalence classes inside of Zn, where the GCD of the equivalence class representative, which I've called m here, with n is 1. In other words, it's everything that's relatively prime to n. And then we had multiplication here for our operation. And we went through why this makes a group last time. So we've got equivalence class of A times equivalence class of B is the equivalence class of A times B. And then finally we had this thing called the quaternion group, which was an example of a non-abelian group of order 8. And it was plus minus 1, plus minus i, plus minus j, and plus minus k. And this can almost be thought of as some extension of like complex numbers. Well, not exactly that, but some extension of the complex number i. So here we have i squared is the same as j squared, which is the same as k squared, which is negative 1. And then furthermore, we have i times j equals k. And there are a couple of more relations that we wrote down last time. But in fact, those all follow from these relations right here. So the fact that i times j equals k, along with these things squaring to negative 1, will lead you towards j times i is negative k, and so on and so forth, like we wrote down in the previous video. So if you need to review these groups, now would be a good time. And maybe if you'd like to show that these are the only relations we need to generate the other relations of the quaternions, that would be a nice exercise as well. Okay, so like I said before, today we're going to be talking about symmetry groups of polygons. But by symmetry groups, I really mean what types of rigid motions can we act on polygons. And by rigid motions, I mean some sort of action or some sort of geometric transformation that leaves the object unchanged. And we'll look at the simplest regular polygon, which is a regular three-gon or an equilateral triangle. Okay, so let's start with our base equilateral triangle first. And so let's draw an equilateral triangle on the board, and then we'll also label the vertices. And I'd like to point out that like in real life, these vertices are not labeled. I'm just kind of labeling them so we can see the action that is performed. And so it may look like the object has changed, but it hasn't. That's just, like I said, the labeling so we can see exactly what action we've done. So let's notice that there are three reflections that can be performed. So what are those three reflections? Well, we could reflect about this axis right here, which goes straight through vertex A and then intersects at the midpoint of BC. Maybe we would call this reflection S sub capital A. 
And then we could have a reflection like this, which goes through vertex B. Maybe we would call that S sub capital B. And then a reflection like this, which goes through vertex C, we could call that S sub capital C. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that we take this reflection SA and we act on our triangle, which uh, I've written in this order, ABC, and that's going to give us a new triangle. So reflecting through that axis will give us the following new triangle. So we'll have ACB because that reflection will fix vertex A, whereas it will swap vertices B and C. Okay, great. And then if we take SB, the reflection that's happening through this vertex B and act on our starter triangle, we get the following. We'll have A, B, C plugged in, and this will give us, let's see, so B will stay the same and then we'll swap A and C. And finally, we have one last reflection like we talked about before. And what is that going to do? Well, let's put our starter triangle in here and that's going to fix C in this case and then swap A and B. Okay, so there we have it. So those are our three reflections. But we don't only have reflections, we also have rotations. And since this is an equilateral triangle, well, we've got three vertices. So the smallest rotation that we can do that will leave this triangle unchanged will be a rotation by 120 degrees. And for the sake of argument, let's say that that is performed counterclockwise. And I'll call that rotation R. So here we have, this is a 120 degree rotation. And like I said, we're going to go counterclockwise. But notice we could also perform a 240 degree rotation counterclockwise, but that's the same thing as performing the 120 degree rotation twice. Or it's the same thing as performing the 120 degree rotation in the opposite direction. And that's because 120 times, and that's because 120 plus 240 is in fact 360. And now let's notice that R cubed is a 360 degree rotation, which that's the same thing as doing nothing. So I'll call that E for our identity, which is a zero degree rotation. In other words, it doesn't do anything to this object. But that gives us three more operations. And those operations will be the identity operation. So we have E acting on our triangle. So let's see, let's put our triangle in here and that just leaves our triangle unchanged. And then we have R acting on our triangle. So let's put our triangle in there again. And now we're gonna rotate 120 degrees counterclockwise. So let's see, that'll move A down to this bottom left vertex. It'll move B to the bottom right vertex and it'll move C up to the top vertex. And then we'll take R squared and apply it here. And let's notice that that will just rotate 120 degrees again to a total of 240 degrees. You know, like we had mentioned, so that's going to move A over here, B to the top, and then C over here. You might say, well, do we have any other actions that we can do to this triangle? And in fact, by a simple counting argument, we don't. So we found one, two, three, four, five, six actions that we can do to this triangle that leave it unchanged. But other than swapping vertices, the triangle is visually unchanged. But that being said, there are exactly six ways to permute the letters A, B, and C. And that's by the kind of counting argument that you did in a discrete math class or an intro to proofs class, which is generally a prerequisite for a class like this. But since we've got six symmetries exhibited here and six permutations, which is like the maximum number of symmetries we could have, then that must mean we have found all of the symmetries. And in fact, we have.
So now that we've done the starting exploration, let's do a couple of more calculations to see if we really need to keep all three of these reflections, or maybe we can write them in terms of one single reflection along with a rotation. So far we've introduced the following notation for our operations that leave the equilateral triangle unchanged. We have reflections SA, SB, and SC that are through the vertices labeled as such. I'd like to notice that if we perform a reflection twice, we get back to the identity. I think that's pretty clear. So reflection SA will fix A, it'll swap B and C. But then if we perform that reflection again, it'll swap B and C back into the original place. So in other words, SA squared is the identity. And likewise, SB squared and SC squared are both also the identity. In fact, any sort of reflection is always gonna be the identity. Then we also had rotations. We had a zero degree rotation, which was the identity. We called that E. Then there was a 120 degree rotation R, that was 120 degrees counterclockwise. And there was a 240 degree rotation R squared. And then there was R cubed, which was a 360 degree rotation, which is the same as not doing anything at all. That is the same as the identity. So, so far I have this over here as our summary. Now I'd like to see how our rotations compose with some of our reflections. And we'll start off just by basing off this with SA, and we'll actually see that we don't need any of the other reflections. Okay, so let's perform this. So we're acting SA onto our starter triangle, and then we will act by R. Let's notice that we're thinking about these objects as functions. And so that means we pass in from the right. And this is maybe a good way of thinking about groups and group operations in general, is that they're generally thought of as compositions of actions on a thing. So here the actions are on this equilateral triangle. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So moving from inside to outside, we will have R acting on, well, what does SA do to this? Well, it fixes A and then it swaps B and C. So we have A, C, B, read in that order. Okay, and now we're gonna perform a rotation 120 degrees counterclockwise. So let's see, that's gonna move A down here, it'll move C right here, and then it'll be move B up to the top. Now let's compare that to our original triangle and notice vertex C is in the same place, but vertex A and B have swapped. So that means this is the same thing as our reflection through SC, uh, maybe acting on our original triangle, A, B, C. Okay, so that's looking good. But now remember these symmetries were exactly defined by what they do to our starter triangle. So that means we can really think about the composition of R with SA to be the same thing as SC. So let's maybe put that up here as a nice observation. So we have R S A is equal to S C, which really means that if we're gonna write this group in the simplest way possible, we will not need the operation S C, and that's because we can exhibit it in terms of our operation R and our operation S A. Okay, so anyway, let's move on to this next one. So here we're going to stick our original triangle into the reflection SA and then we'll rotate it by 240 degrees. So 120 degrees twice. So let's see, that means R squared will be acting on our triangle which fixes vertex A and then swaps vertices B and C. So we have something like that. And then we need to rotate 120 degrees counterclockwise or 240 degrees clockwise. So that'll move A over here, B here, and C here. And now let's compare that to our original triangle and notice that B has been fixed, whereas A and C are swapped. So that means this is in fact SB acting on our original triangle. So I'll write that in there, A, B, C.
So what does that mean? So that means that if we compose r squared with s a, we get s b. So we could put that over here in our observation as well. So r squared composed with s a is equal to s b, which means in fact we don't really need which means, in fact, we don't really need to keep the reflection SB either. We can always write it in terms of our rotation and our original reflection SA. Okay, so all in all, that means that we can take this reflection SA and rewrite it as S. And then after that, we can take these reflections up here and then rewrite them as R as s, r times s, and then r squared times s. So there we've got reflections and rotations. Okay, so that's good, but we have one more thing to talk about before we finally have a big picture of what's going on with this group. What's the commutativity of r with s? So let's maybe look at that now. So far we saw that all of our symmetries of the equilateral triangle could be built out of two pieces. One was this thing that we called S, which was a reflection through an axis going through A. So here I've drawn this axis in yellow. So that's going to fix vertex A and it'll swap vertices B and C. And then we had R, which was a 120 degree rotation, and we took that to be counterclockwise. Although you could maybe equivalently take it to be a clockwise rotation. Also, we noticed that a reflection done twice or this rotation done three times leads us back to the identity. And now to finish this thing off, to understand this group in total, what we need to look at is the commutativity of R with S. So in order to do that, we need to look at four multiplications of these elements. We need to look at R with S, R squared with S, and we also need to look at s with r and s with r squared. So that's the way, so if we can figure out what's going on here, we know how the reflection commutes with all of the rotations. Okay, so let's act with r and s on our original triangle. So let's put our original triangle in there and let's actually get the rest of them set up real quick as well. Okay, so there we've got our setup. And I guess before we keep going, let's observe that we expect only two unique things to happen out of these four multiplications. And that's because maybe from transformational geometry, you know that a combination of a rotation and a reflection is always a reflection. That makes all of these things reflections but none of them are the original reflection. So that leaves us with two remaining reflections as we saw before. The reflection through the axis going through B and through the axis going through C. So that means among these four objects that we're looking at, we only have two reflections to line them up with. So likely this one will be equal to one of these over here, and this one will be equal to one of these over here as well. Okay, so let's do the calculation. So if we act with S first, we'll have R acting on, so we'll have a triangle A is up here, and then B and C are swapped. And then acting with R, let's recall that that is a rotation by 120 degrees counterclockwise. So that's gonna move A over here, C over here, and B up here. All right, well let's now continue with this calculation. So here we'll have R squared acting on, same thing that we have above, good. And then we'll rotate 240 degrees. So that'll give us an A over here, a B over here, and a C over here. So immediately see, we see that these two are not equal. So in fact, none of the vertices line up at all. Here we've got a B in a lower left vertex. Here we have an A in a lower left vertex. And the other twos don't, and the other two don't match either. Okay, so now let's go on to this over here. Now, since we're moving from inside to out, we'll apply the rotation first. So that'll give us an A down here, a B here, and a C here. And now we'll apply the reflection. Now, up here it says that it's the reflection through 
A or through the axis going through A, but really this is thought of as the vertical axis. So our label here will not change the verticality of the reflection. So that means we're reflecting through this vertical axis, which now goes through C. So that means we will fix C and swap B and A. And now let's compare that to anything that we have over here. And notice we have a winner. It's exactly equal to this action. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that SR acting on our starter triangle is the same thing as R squared S acting on our starter triangle. And then let's finish off the calculation over here. So if we apply R squared, what does that leave us with? So that'll put an A here, a C here, and a B here. And then if we apply the reflection, the B will be fixed and the A and the C will swap. And now let's compare that to one of these we have, and it's exactly equal to this one. So we have RS is equal to SR squared. Okay, so in the end, we have RS is equal to SR squared and R squared S is equal to SR. Okay, so that's good. That gives us like commutation rules for R and S. And then the fact that R and S build all of the symmetries of this equilateral triangle mean the symmetries of the equilateral triangle or the group of symmetries of the equilateral triangle are generated by R and S. Okay, so let's do a bit of a summary before we move on to some other symmetry groups. So everything that we saw leads us to the following definition, and that is the group of symmetries of an equilateral triangle is this thing that we'll call D3. And in general, this is an example of something called a dihedral group. And this is the dihedral group of order six, which is two times three. So it's always twice the n-gon that we have. So here we have a three-gon, so it's two times three. And let's recall that that was made up of three rotations and three reflections. So our rotations were E, that's a zero degree rotation, R, which is a 120 degree rotation, and R squared, which was a 240 degree rotation. And then we had reflections. We had S, which is through a vertical axis. We had SR and SR squared. I've changed the order of these just to be like more in line with what is standard. And SR and SR squared are reflections through the line like this and through the lines like this. And I'll let you play a game to figure out which one is which. And then I'd like to point out that we've got some rules that these objects follow. And that is that R cubed is the same thing as XS squared, which is the identity. And then R times S is the same thing as S times R squared. And we had one more, which was R squared times S was the same thing as S times R, but that actually follows from the things that we have on the board already. And now before we move on to another example, I'd like to point out another compact form for writing this down. And I'll do it down here. So we'll have D3 looks like this. So I'm gonna put angle brackets and I'll list R and S here. And R and S are listed to the left of the vertical line, and these are the generators of this group. And by generators, I mean that every element of this group, D3, can be rewritten as combinations of R with S. And you might think, well, we didn't check that this was a group, but in fact, we checked almost everything that we needed to. Since these are reflections, we know that they square to the identity, so you could check that using these commutation rules or just by the fact that they're reflections. But since they square to the identity, they are their own inverse. And then all of these rotations can easily be gotten to the identity by applying them to themselves, so we have inverses there. We'd also, I guess, need to check commutativity, but since all of this is built out of composition of functions, which we know to be commutative, we're okay in that end. Okay, so now back to writing it like this. We have generators R with S, and here we'll put the rules that those satisfy. So we have R cubed is the same thing as S squared, which is E, and then we have RS equals SR squared, and then we end our angle brackets. 
And we're not going to talk so much about this at this moment, but this is a so-called generators and relations way of writing down this group. Or sometimes it's called a presentation of the group. So we have generators here, R and S, and then we have the relations satisfied by these generators over here. So if we wanted to write Q8 with a generators and relations form, maybe it would go something like this. So we have Q8 is generated by I and J. We know I to the fourth is equal to J to the fourth is equal to one. That's because they squared a negative one. And then we have J times I. Well, that's equal to negative K, but that's gonna be minus I times J. And in fact, we don't need K in this picture at all. We can just replace every K with an I times J. And that would be a generators and relations formula for Q8. Okay, so now let's look at another example of one of these symmetry groups. So for our next example, we're gonna look at the symmetry group of a square. And using similar strategies to what we did for the triangle, we can argue that everything is built out of a single rotation and a single reflection. In this case, the rotation is 90 degrees. We'll take it to be counterclockwise. And we can take the reflection to be about this vertical line. So I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. So what I'll do is I'll lay out some squares on the board and we'll look at the path between squares oriented maybe in different ways. So let's start with four squares on the board like this. And let's maybe label the vertices starting here with A, B, C, D. So that'll be like our starter square. And from here, let's apply rotations. So let's say this yellow arrow is applying a rotation. Maybe I'll put up here a yellow arrow just to point out that that's gonna be applying a rotation. So what will that do to our square? So that's gonna move A over here, B down here, C and D. Now let's apply a yellow arrow again, so that's gonna be another rotation, 90 degrees counterclockwise. So now we'll have A, B, C, D like that, and then we'll continue this process. So that'll move A over here to the bottom right, we have B above it, and then C, D. And then let's notice if we apply one more rotation, we get back to the starting point. And that's because if you do a rotation of 90 degrees four times, it's a rotation of 360 degrees, which is like doing nothing at all. So here I'm gonna write this as R to the fourth is equal to simply the identity. So now let's apply our reflection and let's maybe do that with a blue arrow. So here I've got a blue arrow to mean we're going to do our reflection. Okay, so I'm going to put some squares maybe off to the side here because I'll reflect each of these kind of starting things that I have. Okay, good. And remember this is about our vertical axis. So if we reflect up here, that's gonna swap A and B. So A and B get swapped and C and D. So we'll be left with something like that. And then if we apply the reflection again, we'll get back to where we started. So we have something like this. And then let's do this over here. Remember it's a reflection about a vertical axis. So that puts A here, D here, B here, and C here. And like I said, this is gonna be blue arrow, blue arrow applying the reflection. Then the same thing over here, we'll have D, A, and then C, B. And then that's what the reflection does to this square that we have here. Okay, nice. And then finally we'll have C, D, B, A, and that's the result of applying the reflection to this square that we have in the bottom right. Now let's see what happens if we apply rotations to these squares on the outer edge. So if we apply a 90 degree rotation to this square, well, we end up with a square on the board and it's the square over here. So that means if we apply R to this, which was our yellow arrow, we end up with this over here. And then let's apply R one more time and notice that's gonna click D here, C here, B and A in the correct locations as well. So that's gonna move us over here. And then similarly, 
R applied to that one in the bottom right will bring us over here, and then R applied here will bring us back to the beginning. And that would be maybe a complete picture of what's going on here. So let's look at what we have in general. So let's notice that the inner circuit of squares is kind of rotating counterclockwise, or the arrows are moving in a counterclockwise rotation, whereas the outer ones are moving in a clockwise rotation. So I think that's pretty interesting in its own right. But let's see, and let's also notice that there are multiple paths from one square to another, and that'll build the relations between our generators. So let's see what we can get out of this. So let's maybe go from this thing, which is our starting square. So let's maybe put this in red. This is our starting square and then apply a reflection. So if we apply a rotation first, that'll land here. If we apply a reflection second, that will land here. Okay, great. So now let's trace some paths from this uh, red square to this brown square. So like I said, we can apply the rotation first and then the reflection. So let's write that path over here in this magenta color. So applying the rotation first, we'll be putting an R down, and then, and then applying the reflection second, we'll be putting an S down. But let's recall that re applying the reflection second, the S will go to the left because we're thinking about these as functions and you always work from the inside to the outside. Okay, good. So now let's see another way to do this. Well, we can also go in the following order. We could apply this reflection first and then this rotation three times. So doing it like that, we'll have S applied first and then R cubed applied next. So since they have the same starting point and the same ending point, that, that gives us a commutation relation for our generators. So let's put a box around that. So here we have S times R is the same thing as R cubed times S. And then I'll let you like do the same sort of game and you'll find that R times S is the same thing as S times R cubed. And that's in fact enough to describe any of the commutation relations of what's going on in this picture. Okay, so let's maybe do a similar summary to what we did before, but now for the symmetries of this square. So following our notation from before, the group of symmetries of a square is denoted by D4. And that's made up of these eight symmetries. We have four rotations and four reflections. So we have E, R, R squared, and R cubed, where R is a 90 degree rotation, meaning that R squared is a 120 degree rotation and R cubed is a 270 degree rotation. That means that R to the fourth is back to a 360 degree rotation, which is the same as not doing anything. And then we have reflections, S, SR, SR squared, and SR cubed. So in our picture, S is a vertical reflection, but we also have a horizontal reflection and then two diagonal reflections. And so those are SR, SR squared, and SR cubed. I'll let you play the game to figure out which is which. And then we can also write this in a generators and relations form, just like we did before with D3. So we are still generated by R and S. In this case, we know that R to the fourth is the same thing as S squared, which is the identity. S will always square to the identity because it's a reflection. And then we also know that RS is equal to SR cubed via a calculation really similar to what we did before, either in the triangle case by exhausting all possibilities or with the picture that we had before. Well, as you might guess, there's going to be a DN for all natural numbers, and we'd like to describe that now. Now we want to sketch the idea of the symmetry group of a regular n-gon. So I've drawn my n-gon on the board here, so I have of vertex one, two, three, this would be four, and then a bunch in the middle, and then n minus one and n. So obviously we still have rotations and reflections. In this case, we have our starter rotation, which is 360 degrees over n, 
And notice that means we've got exactly n rotations. We have e, r, r squared, all the way up to r to the n minus one. Those are all of the rotational symmetries. And then we have our basic reflection, which we will be about this yellow line. And we've got a bunch of other reflections as well. So S, S, R, S, R squared, all the way up to S, R, N minus one. Those will be reflections about all possible lines of reflectional symmetry here. And now I'd like to prove the following claim, which is the commutation relation between these things which will become generators R and S. And that says that RS is the same thing as SR to the N minus one. So let's see how this goes. And here we can maybe motivate this whole thing with a picture. So let's look at RS applying to our n-gon. But notice the setup of our n-gon is completely determined by, ver by vertices 1, 2, and n. So that's all I'll really draw here. So we'll have 1, we'll have vertex 2, and then we'll have vertex n. Great. And then everything else is like kind of in the middle. Okay, why is everything determined by that? Because we know this goes in order. So one, two, three, all the way around, n minus one, n and one. So let's apply our reflection first. So our reflection is through this. So our reflection will be through this vertical axis here. So that's gonna give us R applied to, let's see, one will stay in the same place, and then N and two will be swapped. So we'll have two over there now and N over there now. And thus, everything else will be swapped. So if we look in the bigger picture, N minus one and three will be swapped, N minus two and four will be swapped, so on and so forth. Okay, so now let's apply the rotation, and that's gonna be a rotation counterclockwise. So let's put our vertices. We only have three vertices to worry about because those kind of describe the whole picture. And if we click this around, 360 over N, that'll put an N right here, it'll put the one down here, but then it'll bring the N minus one up into this location. Okay, good. And now let's do the same thing, but now let's apply S, R, N minus one. So we have S, R, N minus one applied to this same picture. So applying N minus one is applying a 360 over N times N minus one rotation counterclockwise or a 360 over N rotation clockwise. And that's how we'll think about it. So we'll rotate one click clockwise. So that'll leave us with S applied to, so after that first click, we'll have a one here, the N will move up here, and then our N minus one will be here. Okay, nice. And now let's apply S to that, but notice that S is still the reflection about the vertical axis, which now goes through vertex N. And that'll swap one and N minus one, which brings us right over here. So now we've got this loop of equality. So that means we indeed do have RS equals SRN minus one. So now let's summarize that into a general dihedral group definition. So through all of that exploration, we're ready to write down the definition of the dihedral group DN. And this is a group of two N elements or it's of order two times N. So it's the symmetry group of a regular N-gon. So that's gonna be made up of n rotations, e, r, r squared, up to r to the n minus one, and n reflections, s, s, r, up to s, r to the n minus one. And we could write that in generators and relations form as r, s, such that r to the n is equal to s squared, which is the identity, and then RS is equal to SR to the N minus one, which we motivated on the previous board. Okay, so now I'd like to prove the following claim, which will allow us to do calculations within the dihedral group pretty easily. And that says for all M between one and N minus one, we have R to the M S 
is the same thing as s, r to the n minus m. And we'll prove this by induction, which means we need to start with a base case. But notice the base case is the case when m is equal to 1, and when m is equal to 1, this simply turns into r times s is s times r to the n minus 1, which is known by our previous calculation. Okay, so now let's make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for k bigger than or equal to 1, we have, well, the result holds. So r to the k times s is the same thing as s r to the n minus k. Okay, good. And now let's move on with the induction step. So let's consider r to the k plus 1 times s. So that'll be equal to r times r to the k times s. Just splitting this thing up with exponent rules which hold in group operations. Now we can imply, and now we can apply the induction hypothesis to these two terms r, k, s. So that'll give us r, s times r to the n minus k. Now let's notice that we're kind of being loose with our grouping of our elements. So here we have R, R, K, S, but indeed our first step really has R and R, K grouped, but performing the second step has R, K and S grouped. But that's okay because we have associativity, so we can maybe be not quite as careful as it might seem because we're applying that associativity within the group. Okay, so now let's do this again. So swapping r with s will give us the following. We'll have s and then r to the n minus 1 times r to the n minus k. Okay, great. But now let's put this together. This is going to be equal to s times r to the n plus n minus k plus 1, and I'll group that k plus 1 together. But now I'm going to split off an r to the n. That's going to give us s, r to the n, and then r to the n minus k plus 1. But let's recall that r to the n is the identity by our setup over here. So I can just maybe make this r to the n disappear, and that'll leave us with s, r to the n minus k plus 1, which is exactly where we needed to end for this proof to be finished. Okay, so now let's do some sample calculations within dihedral groups. Okay, so let's do a couple of sample calculations. So let's start inside of D4, so that's the symmetry group of a square. So we'll combine SR cubed with SR squared, so that's a composition of two reflections, but different reflections. So we expect this to be a rotation just by general rules of transformations. Okay, so let's apply our associativity first to give us S, with r cubed s, and then we'll have r squared. And now we can swap r cubed and s with our previous result. And recall that our previous result will allow this to be written as s times r to the 4 minus 3. But 4 minus 3 is clearly equal to the number 1. So that's going to give us sr times... So that'll end up giving us s times s times r from this r to the 4 minus 3 times r squared. But s times s is equal to the identity, so that like disappears and we're left with r cubed. So those two reflections compose to the rotation by 270 degrees. Now let's see in d7, let's calculate s r to the fifth, s r to the negative third, and then s r squared. But by r to the negative third, I really mean r to the fourth, because negative three is the same thing as four mod seven, which is how these rotations are working. Okay, so now let's maybe work on these two terms first. And we'll do some associativity. So that's going to give us an s, and then we have r to the fifth s, r to the fourth. And here, let's maybe do commutativity on this. Okay, and then we'll just bring this down. So we have s r squared. Great, and then we'll apply our rule to this r to the fifth s, and that'll give us s times s times r squared, because that's 7 minus 5. 
And then we'll have this r to the fourth, which we bring down. And then we have this sr squared that we bring down. And now let's see what cancels. So s times s is equal to the identity because it's two reflections in a row. And then we have r squared r to the fourth, so that'll be r to the sixth on s, and then r squared. And now we can apply our rule again to this. That'll leave us with s r to the seven minus six, which is r to the one times r squared. So in the end, this is s r cubed. So that would be a final calculation in D7. Okay, so now I'm gonna leave you with some warm-up exercises. So I've got three warm-up exercises for you. The first is to simplify the following objects in the appropriate dihedral group. So first we have sr to the fifth r sr cubed in D4, then we have sr to the fourth sr squared in D6, and finally r cubed sr in D4. And then next is a question which says, can you find an n such that dn is abelian? That means it's commutative. So I'll give you a hint that there are two. So next, can you draw a picture of an object whose symmetry group is this dn? And then finally, let's make a Cayley table for d3. And that's a good place to stop.